Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Sandals Church, man. I'm so glad you guys are here. We are in week seven. We've been in this series for seven weeks. Actually, that's not true. Eight weeks, right? I can't remember. I can't count. We're at week seven, The Enthusiast. I'm so excited. I hope that you're ready to be enthused. We're going to talk about this amazing, amazing personality type. And I just want you to know God is doing amazing things. And if you're a guest, God loves you. He created you. You are not a mistake. There's no such thing as accidental kids, just accidental parents. We are glad that you are here. We love you. God loves you. And he has a plan for your life. So let's just begin with a word of prayer and thank God for just making us so incredibly and wonderfully awesome, right? That's hard for some of us to say, but you are awesome. You don't have any idea how awesome you are, but God does. And he wants to reveal that to you today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, I just pray, Lord, for all of us. So many of us, Lord, are wrestling with how we're made, how we look. Lord, how we walk, how we talk, Lord. We're wrestling with so many issues, God, and I just pray that we would rest in the security of knowing that you are God and you made us to be us. And you've not called us to be anybody else because everybody else is already taken. So God, let us not fall into the sin of comparison, God, but let us look to you, the author and perfecter, Lord, not only of our faith, but of our life. And speak to us today, God, how much you love us, how much we mean to you, And God, challenge us to change our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, now, if you grew up Baptist, you're going to be a little uncomfortable with the sermon today because it involves the word dancing, okay? Right? When I was a kid, um, right before I got married, my dad said, you know why Baptists are opposed to sex? And I said, I don't know why, Dad. He said, because it might lead to dancing. That's how serious they were about this. So seriously, seriously concerned about that. And uh, if you're a Baptist, you got that. All right. So let's begin with our notes. It says, and David danced before the Lord. Now, some of you are uncomfortable. We worship. Like, you get a little radical. You're like, whoo, you know, no, put that hand down, put this hand down. Some of you, you know, you just can't even do this. But, man, we're talking about the enthusiasts. And so when they worship God, there is body movement that is involved. David danced before the Lord with all of his might. Write in your notes, footloose. (laughs) Footloose, man. It cracks me up, man. I, you know, I, I've been married to Tammy for 21 years. We have two daughters, and they love to watch Footloose. And they did, recently did a remake of Footloose. And I have to tell my girls and my wife every time, you know when guys are frustrated, when they're really, really angry? They don't go drive a Volkswagen and dance. That is not, that is not, right, guys? You have never, ever thought, I am so mad. I am so ticked. Give me my Walkman, you know. <laughs> right? You just, mm, Right? Unless your name is Michael Jackson, you don't do that, right? That's not how guys work. It's always funny to me how women think men are. I'm like, this is, this is not how we are. We are not like, you know, there's that thing in the movie where he, you know, he, uh, I'm like, that is not masculine. That is not masculine. <laughs> Man, it's just, anyways, okay, think Footloose or Christ, Christ Cella. Either, either of those, that's where we are today. Uh, if you don't know what Christ Cella is, it's like Coachella, but they charge you more because they're Christian. So, um, so David danced before the Lord. Now, who's David? Some of you are like, who's David? I don't know who this guy is. He's dancing. He's a dancing David. David is one of the most important biblical figures in the Bible. Man, he is a man after God's own heart. He is selected by God, and you need to know about his life. A great, great man who did great things and did horrible things, but whatever he did, he did it with all his might. No matter what direction he was going, towards heaven or towards hell, he was having fun. And uh, he screwed up his life and many, many others' lives. But in this moment, David is dancing before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So this is like a pope in the mosh pit, That's what, right? This is what this is. And all the Catholics are like, ah. It's funny when you make fun of the Baptist, but you bring the pope into it, and now I'm uncomfortable. I'm just saying, it says... It says he danced with all his might and he's wearing a priestly garment. So that's what the scripture says, be mad at God. Okay, that's what it says. So David and all of the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord. And some of you are like, what's that? Unless, of course, you've seen Indiana Jones. And that's not what that is. It's kind of like that, but not, not like that. So the ark of the Lord, is, it's a box. That's what it, it's a box that they carry. And it has the remnants of the Ten Commandments in it. And if you don't know what the Ten Commandments are. Man, I'm glad you're at Sandals Church because <laughs> you need to know what those are. They're important. So, and, and when, they, when they go to fight, it's the presence of God. And when they lead with it, there's no army that can stand before them, but they find out that 
when they sin, God doesn't care whether or not you have the box. But anyways, that's, that's what they believe. So, so God's in this box, and so they have it. They, they got it, and they're super excited about it. It's the presence of God. It's the presence of God, and David is super, super excited. And so Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy. Shouts of joy. Man, some of you are going to be convicted about how you worship. The only thing you've ever shouted out is at your TV when your team is losing. That's, that's, when, that's when you praise. That's when you give a shout out, right? It, it just is. And you're in church, man. I mean, you're, you're more passionate, many of you, about the Broncos than you are about Jesus. And, and you got to check yourself. David, man, when he worships, he gets excited. He gets excited. And so they brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the blowing of ram's horns, man. It's crazy. They got instruments. He would have played the electric guitar if he had one, but he doesn't. He's got a ram's horn, so that's what he's got to work with. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, boom, 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 every party has a pooper. That's why we invited you, circle her name, Michael, right? That's who she is. She plays the role of the womp, womp, womp. As he enters into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, who is also his wife, but for whatever reason, they didn't put that in there, looked down from her window. And there she saw the king. Remember I said footloose? What is he doing? Leaping and, le right? Leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she was filled with contempt for him. That's what some of you guys do when somebody lifts a hand. You're like, well, is that genuine? Is that, is that, are you genuinely praising the Lord? Isn't it amazing how critical we are when everybody else cuts loose and worships? We're just like, we're just like looking at that, you know? I mean, I'm not saying get crazy. One time I went to a charismatic church and this gal was barking like a dog. I thought that was a bit much. I was like, okay, just don't bite my leg. Um, but if that's how you worship, that's how you worship. So, and I love teasing her pastor because he's one of my good friends and uh, he hates it when I bring that story up. But anyways, so when she saw David leaping and dancing and okay, wives, you've all seen your husband doing something where you're like, nah. amen, ladies, come on, own it. Hmm. I mean, guys, if you're single, wives are like the rails in the bowling alley. You don't think you need them? <laughs> I'm going to bowl three. No, you're not going to bowl 300. You got those lanes, and they let you know when you're in the gutter. Okay, just that's free. You don't, have to, you don't even have to tithe on that one. Just So she's looking at her husband, and, and right, she's embarrassed. Why? Because footloose is embarrassing. It is. He's dancing and he's leaping before the Lord and she's filled with contempt for him. And they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the special tent David had prepared for it. And David placed burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. But when he had finished his sacrifices, David blessed the people in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. And he gave to every Israelite man and woman in the crowd a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins. He had me until raisins, I think raisins are depressed grapes. <laughs> it's an ongoing fight between my wife and I. She always buys raisins, and they're never not in the cupboard, right? And I don't even know how you know when a raisin goes bad. Anyways, let's move on. <laughs> then all of the people returned to their homes. When David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. You know you're in trouble when the wife is in the driveway. She, she said in disgust how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vocal person might do. Whoa. Now, we don't know what happened, but at some point, Christ Cella became Coachella and clothing went flying. And I guess what happens, you know, when you're leaping over a Volkswagen, you know, stuff, you're not responsible for the linen ephod flying off. It just, you know, that just happens. But she noticed, and listen to what she says. She says, how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father. Ooh, just got personal. Her father was Saul, the former king of Israel. 
who chose me above your father and all his family. And he appointed me the leader of Israel, the people of the Lord. So I celebrate before the Lord. Yes. And I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servant girls you mentioned will indeed think I am distinguished. He says, look, man, when I worship God, things get a little crazy. They get a little crazy. Little nuts, little out there. But that's how God made me. That's who I am. And when I worship God, I do it with everything I have. That's what the enthusiast does. Whatever they're doing, they're all in. They're all in all the time. All the time. Even worshiping God, things get a lot out of control. You're like, ooh, come back, come back, come back. It's okay. It's okay. We love you. Put your clothes back on, right? We don't want to call the police. We love you. So who is the enthusiast? The enthusiast reflects God's joy. I mean, anybody ever been to a church service and you're, and you're just like, God must hate us all. I mean, Tammy and I, we've been to Europe and we go in those churches and I made the mistake of going down to the break room where all the pastors congregate. They must have been eating raisins. I don't know, <laughs> their faces look like raisins. You know, it's just, you ever been to church and I just love the Lord so much? Then tell your face. <laughs> look at some of you are uncomfortable right now because you're laughing in church and you don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, just tell me I'm going to hell. I, I'm, I'm confused. Well, you might be going to hell, so I'm gonna make you laugh and then remind you of where you're going, okay, at the end. <laughs> but the enthusiast reflects God's joy. God is a God of joy, right? He, he, he loves to laugh, he loves to celebrate. This is who God is. When Jesus talks about judgment, he also talks about a party. You just choose which room you spend eternity in. A cell or in celebration? Those are your options. You get to choose. God loves a good time. God loves to party. God loves to celebrate. He just loves to do it in such a way that nobody gets hurt, pukes, gets arrested, or connect, gets some disease. <laughs> this side of the room got that. Yeah, over here. <laughs> right? The enthusiast reflects God's joy. Here's their motivation. Here's what drives them. If you are a seven, if you are an enthusiast, at the core of who you are, this is your internal motor. The motivation is pleasure and to avoid pain. To avoid pain and to pursue pleasure. And let me just say this. God is the author of pleasure. We always act like, oh, yes, we... How was your time in Vegas? Well, we were praying most of the time and we gathered together for the heathens who were going to hell. And no, no, did you have a good time, right? I didn't ask you, did you sin? How sad is it, right? When something's really good, like when you eat chocolate cake, oh, this is sinfully delicious. <laughs> well, do you know why the world says something when it's so good is sinfully delicious? Because they've been to church and they didn't see anything delicious. Like, I'm never going back. That was terrible. Right? The motivation is pleasure and to avoid pain. Here's the beauty of the enthusiast. When healthy, they are able to bring and to, or to find joy in all situations. If you have a terrible job, if you hate your job, hire sevens. It doesn't matter how crappy the job is, sevens will find a way to have fun. To have fun. Seven as you can imagine, is my second highest number. <laughs> when my wife and I first got married, we would go to a party. She would actually say this, don't unleash all of Matt Brown. <laughs> she would say, be funny, but not too funny. Right? She's a little nervous. A little nervous of what, what might happen because when you pop the cork off a seven, you don't know what happens but they're able to bring joy in all situations. Anybody ever had a crappy job? Raise your hands. Unless, of course, you're in it right now and your boss is next to you. <laughs> oh my gosh, right? We've had some bad jobs. 
We have had some bad jobs. One of the worst jobs I ever had was in the 1990s. They were transferring everything from actual files to this technology called microfish. Some of you have no idea what that is. But it was where you would literally take microscopic pictures of documents and shrink them so that the government could store all their information. It was a horrible job. Literally, this is what I did all day for eight hours a day. Diggy, diggy, diggy. It was terrible. Absolutely terrible. I used to announce to everybody, we just made 20 cents. We just made 30 cents. People hated me. <laughs> so we had quotas, right? We had quotas. You had to take so many pictures on microfish a day to keep your job. I never met quota. Never once. One day, this got the attention of the owners of the company. And so they called me in, and I kid you not, we worked in a long building with one long hallway, and I was all the way at the end, I had to walk in front of everybody. Everybody's like, oh, Matt's getting fired, he's getting fired. This is it, I knew this was happening, he never makes quota, right? And they would rank everybody according to efficiency on this chart, and I was always at the bottom. So I go in, and I'm sitting in these owner's office, and this is what they said, you're the worst employee we have. I said, I know. This is the owner said. He said, but this job sucks. And you make everybody want to come. They gave me a raise. I got a raise. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. I walked out of there. That's right, everybody. I'm making a nickel an hour more than you. I kid, that really happened. Here's these owners. They knew it was terrible work. They knew it was awful. And it was fun to have somebody there who could make light of a terrible situation. They're able to bring or find joy in all situations. Listen, I mean, isn't it true? It's not just what you do, but who you work with. It, 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 I mean, you could have a really cool job, but if everybody's terrible, you don't wanna be there. You wanna be somewhere else. You need to think about that. It's not just what you do, it's who you have to do it with that matters. Do life with fun people, and sevens are fun. Here's this, they're visionary. They're visionary. Why would God choose a seven to lead Israel? Because he wanted him to have a vision. Here's who we're gonna be. We're gonna be different. We're not gonna be like everybody else. They're versatile. Sevens can do many things, right? It doesn't matter what you do, it matters can you have fun? Can you find a way to have a good time? Sevens don't get locked in. They just want to have a good time. They want to be with people. They want to be on a team. They can lead the team, be on the team, be on the coach, be on the bench. They don't care. They're versatile. They don't get trapped in, I am what I do. Next, they're resilient. Why? They're optimistic. They're positive. They believe in things that people can't see. If you're negative, hang out with a seven. Hang out. Find one, right? You know, are you a glass half empty or half full? What are you? If you're half empty, you need to be around somebody who's half full to level you out. They're resilient. Next, they inspire people. They inspire people. That's what they do, right? Do you know what grade I got in preaching in seminary? Does anybody know? Don't shout it out too loud if you know, because it hurts still. Anybody know what grade I got? F, who said it over there, okay? I wanna find out who that was. <laughs> F does not stand for fantastic. Do you, do you know why I failed preaching? Because I didn't preach like they, they said I should. And you know why? Because I thought that was boring. I don't think that works. Man, I don't think God's passion in my life is to put people to sleep. I don't think that's my passion. Some of you have been to church, the best nap of the week. <laughs> right? I want to inspire people to live a better life, to live for God, to make the world a better place. There's enough crappiness out there. We don't need to include church. They inspire people in projects. We can do this. We can do this. We can make this happen. Right? California literally has the least amount of Christians of any state in the United States, and people ask me all the time, when are you moving? Never. 
Never. Why do I want to go where there are already Christians? I want to reach lost people to Jesus because they need to know there's hope in this world and there's goodness in Jesus. Everybody else can run. Run. Go. But they inspire people in projects. When healthy, they engage in fun, right? They like to have a good time. Don't apologize because you want to have fun. Don't apologize. Well, I want to be taken seriously. Why? Why? People make fun of my preaching all the time. Well, he's just a comedian. <laughs> Wait for it. I'm going to punch you in your gut. It's coming. <laughs> yeah! oh! Oh! That kind of hurt, but I'm going to come back next week because I like to laugh. Literally, here's my, here's my theory in preaching. It's punch and hug. I'm going to punch you and then give you a little hug. And then I'm going to hit you again. So they engage in fun. Why? They desire to make the world a more joy-filled place. Do we need more sadness? Is the world bankrupt of sorrow? Right? You know what we need is more depression. I feel like this world's just so happy-go-lucky. I need to go to church to remind myself that life sucks and so do I. <laughs> if you're a seven, if you're an enthusiast, here's your core need. And if you love someone who is this, you need to know this. This drives them. Sevens fear a cage. They desire to be free, to be free. David decided to be free of clothing. <laughs> right? You ever watch a little kid dance? They don't care, they don't care. It's, 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 it's hilarious, you know? You go to the beach, bathing suit, phew. I'm three! Now if you're 30, you're going to jail if you, phew, right? But the core need is to be free. And here's what's so sad is, everything about American culture is trying to put you in a box. Don't let people figure you out and force you into a box. When unhealthy, man, pleasure dictates their life choices. You know, David, he had many wives. He could have any woman that he wanted. But he found himself looking at a married woman bathing naked. And he said, I gotta have her. How sad is that? He's the king. He can have anything he wants, but he chooses the one thing he can't have. And it wrecked him in his whole life. It destroyed him. Pleasure dictates their life cho choices. Literally, if you're a seven, you gotta be careful that what feels good, it doesn't mean that you need to do it because that's what sevens will do, whatever feels good. Pleasure dictates their life choices. Next, they escape pain at all cost, all cost. They run from pain. And I got news for you. The depth of pain you experience in life, I believe, is directly proportionate to your joy. Right? It's one of the things that I think is going to make heaven so spectacular is we will know what joy is because we knew what pain was. If you're seven, you got to embrace pain. People die. You get fired. Bad things happen. Good people get cancer. The life doesn't, life doesn't make sense. David ran from pain. He went through deep, deep pain. And every time you see it, he runs from it. One of his own sons takes sexual advantage of one of his own daughters. And David does nothing. Nothing. And he runs from it. He ignores it. He won't confront his son. He won't challenge his son. And listen to me, if you're a seven, your job is not to make your kids your friends. You're supposed to be their dad or their mom. Your job is not to make your children like you. 
It's to, to try to raise them so when they're adults, people like them. And you got to challenge bad behavior. You have to challenge immorality. You have to challenge your children, even if it hurts. Even in marriage, you want a great marriage? You got to talk about the bad things. You got to talk about the ugly things. You got to talk about the difficult things. You want to destroy your marriage? Run from pain. Run from hurt. Run from sorrow. Because eventually, it will find you because you can't outrun what's happened to you in your life. You deal with it or it will deal with you. But that's what happens to sevens. So guess what, sevens? You don't stay in a job. You move on from job to job to job. You move on from relationship to relationship to relationship. You move on from friendship to friendship to friendship because as soon as it gets difficult, you're out. Listen, I believe there's a reason God called me to be at one church my whole life because he knew it was the only way I'd grow. He knew it's the only way I'd change by sitting in painful situations and dealing with it. And let me tell you something. God made me fast. I'm great at running. But I've had to learn. You can't outrun pain. It will catch you. Have the hard conversation. Have the difficult conversation. Next, an unhealthy seven can become impulsive. Simply react. This is why you're a seven. You need Jesus. You need Jesus to guide you, to ground you, and to direct you. Literally, if you are a seven without God in your life, you are a balloon in the air that is just floating in and out of storms. You need a rudder. You need a compass. You need to be directive. Listen, when you're impulsive, you usually don't make a good decision. Like if these words ever come out of your mouth, what could go wrong? Don't do it. Don't do it. If the reasoning behind the decision is what could go wrong, that is don't do it. Don't do it. They can become impulsive and just go after it. Well, there's a naked woman in the shower. Her name's Bathsheba. What could possibly go wrong? I don't know, David. Oops, Bathsheba gets pregnant. What do you do? Um, kill her husband. Some of you didn't know that. That's what David did. Uriah was a faithful soldier, faithful to David, faithful to Israel, faithful to God. And here's what David said. Take Uriah to the front of the battlefield. And when the battle and the fighting is most fierce, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pull back and leave Uriah all by himself. And Uriah dies. And listen to me, sevens. David may have been the king of Israel and got away with that sin, but guess who was watching? God. God. And so God sent a prophet by the name of Nathan to challenge David. They can become impulsive. They can become reckless. The definition of reckless is to act without thinking or caring about the consequences. Now we sing that song, Reckless Love. Here's what it means about God. God acted in Jesus Christ in a way that was reckless to the life of Jesus. It's not that he didn't think about it, it's that he didn't care about the consequence because he cared about you. So when you're reckless, don't you dare act like, like you're like Jesus. You're not dying for everybody else, you're dying for your passions, for your desires, for your feelings. How many hearts have been broken in the name of happiness? Well, God would want me to be happy. Show me that verse. Happiness is found in him. And to pursue him, we need to pursue righteousness, holiness. Listen, we, we live in a world that's pursuing happiness. The evidence is all around. It's all around. Listen to me, if you're under 30, if you're under 30, listen to me. The world says, have sex however you want, whenever you want, with whomever you want. STDs in California this year, this year, up 300,000 cases. Tammy and I are watching the news the other night. We're watching the news. Tonight at 11, someone else died, got shot, got murdered, got killed, you're all gonna die, right? That's the news. And he's just talking, 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 you're all gonna die, 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 die. And he's standing in front of a billboard. And because I have ADD, that means I'm not listening to what he's saying, I'm looking at everything else around him. 
I look and I say, look at the billboard, look at the billboard. And everyone else in my family is like, what billboard? I go, look at the billboard, read the billboard. Here's this guy, News at 11, and he's talking about how one person got shot in Southern California and we should all be aware and lock our doors. And right behind him on a big sign, it says this, syphilis is serious. <laughs> Listen to me, young people, don't lock your door, lock your doors. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Why? Syphilis is serious. <laughs> but you're never going to hear that. You're never going to hear that. We live in a world like there's no consequence, like nothing. Listen to me, things matter. And they behave irresponsibly. Listen to me, parents, you wanna do your kids a favor? Raise them knowing they have to grow up. I tell my kids all the time, one day I expect to not support you financially. That's the goal. And to go out and work and support yourself and give back and contribute positively to society. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, it's called adulthood. <laughs> they behave irresponsibly. What's the core sin of the seven? Gluttony. Doesn't that sound cool? If you're a seven, I'm a glutton. Man, sevens love a party. They don't care what it is. Anybody ever ate so much at Thanksgiving you just had to repent? Like every year, I'm like, I'm not gonna do that again. Like I'm, this year, it's, it's really about being thankful to God. How sad is that the one holiday that's actually named Eucharist, that's what it is, Thanksgiving, we all just pork out. And then you just hate yourself. Just, oh, oh, it hurts so bad. That's what gluttony is, man. If one turkey leg is good, why not two? Why not three, why not four? Right, if sex is good with one person, why not two, why not three, why not four, why not five, why not whatever? Gluttony is a drive for more, whatever it is. It can binge on sex, it can binge on food, it can binge on Netflix. I'm gonna watch the whole season. I'm not even gonna sleep. And you just sit there. Oh my gosh, what time is it? Uh, 11, and it's Tuesday. I've been sitting here since Sunday. This is strange. <laughs> right? You know, I mean, if you get to the bottom of the ice cream and you can't figure out why the fork can't scrape through the container, this might be you. The fork, the spoon. <laughs> I'm civilized. Come on. I mean, a fork will work if it's really frozen, but you know what I'm saying. So what's the core fear? The core fear of the seven is being deprived or trapped. A seven has FOMO, fear of missing out. Gotta go, gotta be there, gotta be there, gotta be there, gotta be there, I can't miss out, I can't miss out, I can't miss out. And listen to me, if you're a seven, guess what Instagram is saying? You're missing out, you're missing out, you're missing out, you're missing out. Facebook, oh, you should have been here. Oh, you're such a loser. Oh, it's too bad you didn't get invited. Oh, it's too bad you actually have a real life with responsibilities, right? So here's how the seven needs to be real. How to be real with yourself as a seven. The apostle Paul who writes half of the Christian Bible says these words, I have learned, circle that word, learned. I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. See, here's the lie we tell ourselves, that, that doing the right thing will be a feeling that I have one day. Listen to me, th th this, is, this is one of the reasons why so many young people are, are, are just literally falling off the grid in terms of being able to support themselves because they believe one day they'll feel like doing good. Listen to me, it's a miracle most of us aren't homeless. It's hard to get up and do things we don't wanna do to provide for ourselves. It's hard. He says, I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I've learned the secret of living in every situation. Here's the secret. In every situation, I can make it through this. I can do this. 
He says, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Paul is not talking about running a marathon or lifting weights. He's talking about getting through the day without coveting what everybody else has. If you're a seven, you gotta learn to be content with what you have. Because guess what robs the joy of what you have looking at what you don't have? Practice contentment by learning to reflect and to thank God for what he's done. Reflection is the key to contentment. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Thank you. Thank you. This weekend, my wife, I just love her so much. She, she planned a, a family night. And you know, I know many of you, your kids are grown. And for some of you, you know, all of our kids grow up too fast. But we went to a, a, a theater down in Los Angeles and we watched a reenactment of the movie Beauty and the Beast. And it was fantastic. And at one point, I'm just gonna be honest with you, I, cr I was crying, which of course my family finds hilarious. <laughs> right? I, I just, I just, I, I'm just crying, you know, tale as old as time. I'm not gonna sing it, but you, you know it. <laughs> you know, neither one prepared, you know, unexpected. I mean, th that song is just so incredible, but you know, you know what made me cry? It wasn't the production. It was remembering when my girls were little and watching them in their yellow dresses. And it wasn't regretting that they've grown, it was being thankful that I got to be a part of it. I got to be their dad. Now my son slept through the whole thing. <laughs> he, did. he did, we paid $80 for, or $180 for him to have a nap. He's 15, welcome to 15 year old boys. Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> Galatians 5.22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy. Who said God doesn't want you to be happy? You just don't know what happiness is. Love, joy, oh, you're gonna hate this word, self-control. Some of you believe this lie from hell. You believe you can't control yourself. Be honest and say this, I don't want to control myself. I don't want to. Right? Some of us are like little children. Why did you do that? I don't know. <laughs> I know why you did it. Because you wanted to. And you're not as cute as a little kid. How to be real with God if you're seven. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. God is the author of pleasure and he has offered for you to spend eternity with him. How to be real with others. I love this. Jonathan, who I believe is a six, the loyal friend, the loyalist, made David, same David we're talking about, reaffirm his vow of friendship. Why? He's flighty, he's a seven. Sevens, if they're not careful, can be a mile wide and an inch deep. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his vow of friendship again. Circle that word, again. Why? He's a seven. For Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. Jonathan was a loyal friend to David. But he had to make David, David, I need you to recommit. I need you to recommit. Not everything is about fun. Some things are difficult. Some things are hard. And the most beautiful friendships are the ones that last. So how to love a seven? How do you love a seven? Let me just ask you, how many of you have a seven in your life? Raise your hand if you think you have a seven, okay? Some of you need to get some sevens. Next, if you have a seven in your life, give them lots of room to play. Give them lots of room. They gotta have room to play. They gotta have room to have fun. You gotta give them room, right? I was sitting a couple years ago at school and my son was in trouble. And literally, you know, I'm sitting in this, this room with four women teachers. And I'm like, I, I, said, I said, literally, is there not a man here 
that can talk to me about my son? And this woman teacher said this to me, it's okay, I've studied men. <laughs> I could, that, that's what she said, I've studied men. Well, it's not going very well. So, here, right, my, my son was struggling in school and this was their counsel. Maybe you should take away recess. I said, it's the only part of school he likes. Maybe we should throw him off a building. Okay, look, sevens are gonna have a hard time sitting still. Sevens are gonna have a hard time caring about Pharaoh and how many stones it took to build the pyramids. But they do care about how many minutes there are in recess. Next, recognize when they choose to deal with problems. Don't go, it's about time. It's about time, David, that you got real with your stripping problem. <laughs> strip, 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 strip. Next, share how much joy they bring to your life. Man, if you throw lousy parties, invite a seven. And when they ask, what are we gonna do? You say, whatever you do, we'll just, <laughs> as long as it's not immoral, illegal, or the police don't show up, I'll follow. Next, next, and please know this as a seven, join in the fun. You know what makes my life more fun? You, you, smile, tell your face, have a good time, live a little, right? Life is serious enough, it's serious enough, and we've got to learn to relax. We sweat things that just don't matter. We make big deals of little things. I mean, whatever. Get over yourself and learn to have a good time and join the seven. How different would the story have been if Michael had jumped down there and, you know, maybe let some clothing loose? It'd be a different story, and I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> I'm just saying. They would have had a better marriage if she could have loosened up a little bit and danced and praised the Lord with her husband, rather than making fun of his desire to enjoy life. Here's my prayer for the seven. God, help me to run to you and not from the pain or towards all pleasure. Help me to develop deep and lasting friendships with people who want to have fun, but that can keep me grounded. Help me to have the tough conversations real life requires and remind me to be thankful for what you've done. For what you've done. Listen, sevens, we love you, you brighten our days, but make sure you're following Jesus or the party will end when your life is over. So make sure you make it to the big party, and the only way you do that is through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we are so thankful and so grateful, Lord, for the enthusiasts in our life, for the people that make even mundane jobs fun, that bring joy, Lord, to boring business meetings, or Lord, things that we don't wanna do but we have to do, we're grateful for them. God, help us to love them and celebrate them. God, for the sevens in here, help us, Lord, to not just live for pleasure but to live for you, to not run from pain but to embrace it as a part of life. God, bless us all with a desire to be real and to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.